Uh, we're both, <coughs> anyway, going to talk about our personal involvement with women's history and how it came about, one by one, starting with me, and then we'll have a conversation arising from that, okay? I, will, I was an undergraduate in Oxford from 1961 to 64, one of that tiny percentage that Sally mentioned. Um, but as far as I remember, there was no women's history at all. I'm sure Eileen Power was mentioned by our medieval tutor, who was an, an eminent woman, medievalist, uh, but not singled out particularly for her feminism. But otherwise, in those pre-women's liberation movement days, nothing else. And I guess Selina can tell us later whether Oxford has changed in the intervening 50 years. After three years, I went to LSE and I thought not, not only left Oxford, but left history, moving into the social sciences. But this is when the social sciences were developing and flourishing. And I felt one needed to know about sociology, economics, statistics. LSE had a good course in this. And also it was a department run by Richard Titmus. And I not only, I went to Oxford as a medievalist and came out of it mainly interested in contemporary issues. I went as a working class conservative and came out a middle class socialist. <laughs> <laughs> One thing for which I'm certainly grateful to Oxford. I have a particular interest in social policy and what to do about problems of policy, poverty. And the great guru in that field in those days was Richard Titmus at LSE. And it was he, his department that ran this course. I went along to learn about the social sciences, expecting really to move into working on research on social problems. But then Richard Titmus and his colleague Brian Abel Smith, who were advisors to the Labour government on pensions policy, gently guided me as a historian into doing a PhD on the history of pensions policy, because they realised they didn't know how, what had happened before Beveridge, how our actually pretty terrible pension system they were trying to improve had come about. <coughs> and alas, Labour never really listened to them, and it remains a terrible pension system. So I did my PhD, <coughs> starting in 1965, on the history of pensions, which was a topic which, at the time, I thought had no women in it. It was about pensions for men after years of work. The campaigns were led by men. It was male politicians who brought them about. So I, and that seemed quite normal in 1965. Um, two years later, I actually started my first job at Goldsmiths College, um, <clears throat> which was initially a half-time post, which was likely to build up in the social policy department, teaching social history, something where Richard Timmons' influence was very helpful. And Goldsmiths had, that department had no problem at all in employing not just a woman, but a pregnant woman because I was not very pregnant when interviewed. My daughter was born in the July. I started teaching in October. And this, I don't recall being the slightest issue in contrast to what some people have said about history departments. And I must say, <coughs> and when I started, I remember my male head of department saying, you don't have to come in except when you absolutely have to to teach which is on her. And there was no pressure to publish. I didn't for 10 years. It was a, a very different world, but it was also a different world from many history departments, I think. And I must say, <coughs> I remained very glad to have been in a social science and not a history department. And I used to go to seminars at the Institute of Historical Research, which is a great way of keeping contact with historians and where I met a large, probably most people in this room. But constantly said to myself, I'm so glad I'm not in one of those history departments <laughs> because they did seem to be so stuffy and male dominated and 
<clears throat> uninterested in the kinds of things I was interested in. Um, being in the social, I don't know, in a mixed social science department also meant one had a range of influences and ideas and got used to collaborating with people from very different backgrounds, which has always been useful. <clears throat> and in fact, I've never had a conventional history job. And also goes to me that I had a very good mixed range of students, mature students, even the occasional black and Asian student, uh, which was relatively unusual in those days, <clears throat> and more from working class backgrounds. But I started in 67, I hadn't quite finished my PhD, and of course after 68, feminism arrived, and I became obviously a, aware of it. Not very active, because I had a small child and I was teaching and finishing a PhD, but I went to demonstrations, conferences, and I went to the early history workshop conferences had friends increasingly in other European countries with whom I talked about um, women's issues, women's history, and other political issues. But I was actually more active in the Labour Party, um, which I think was my real commitment more than anything. Um, and I was still very interested in social policy, and in particularly in it issues about reducing income disparities and reducing poverty. I think, again, one of the effects of Oxford is moving between the sleek prosperity of Oxford. And there's still often very visible poverty of Merseyside, where I came from, and which I think also had influenced my change of interests. Um, but while being active in Labour Party politics, I was and remain interested in promoting and studying the role of women in politics, including in the Labour Party, and I've written some things on the history of that. And interested in the positive, women as a positive force in politics, or exploring where they could be positive, rather than as the negative sub subordinate roles they're often presented as having. But meanwhile, in 1970, I got my PhD, still with no women in it. And then a, a few years later, a couple of years later, I can't remember exactly when, I revisited the research after some years of having feminism around. I, I wanted to publish some stuff. I went back to some of the archives. And found to my astonishment, there were women all over the sources, and I just hadn't noticed them that it had been pointed out in the surveys of the late 19th century that women were a majority of older people because they lived longer as we still do. They were also more likely to be poorer than men for obvious reasons. They had less opportunity to accumulate assets. And that the policy makers were very aware of that. And it was a determinant of the form that the first pensions legislation in 1908 took that the reason that Britain had non-contributory, means-tested pensions focused on the very poor, unlike Germany, which had insurance-based pensions <coughs> for which con contributions were paid by skilled men, and they were the main beneficiaries, was that the British pension was about solving poverty, and most poor old people were female, and only they and they could only be helped by a non-contributory pension. The German scheme had a quite different objective to keep skilled workmen happy. Um, and so it took a different form. And so that, well, it transformed my view of the whole topic, and I haven't stopped banging on about it ever since. And it did get me um, <clears throat> interested in the whole issue of women and poverty. Also because at the time in social policy, feminists were talking a, a lot about what they called the feminization of poverty. Because they discovered lots of poor women <coughs> in the, the present. Mm. But I disliked this feminization notion because it seemed to suggest it was something new. And 
everything I read suggested me, to me it had long been true and probably always was true. And, and that's what led on to the article I published in History Workshop in 1978 about the relative poverty of women and how the poor Lord treated them. And um, I've had an enjoying interest in various aspects of women and poverty and how to stop it, including in our the recent book co-edited, co-written with Tanya Evans on <coughs> unmarried mothers. Now, the great advantage of the goldsmith's job was I was completely free to teach what I wanted. I ran my own course. I was the only historian. And so long as the students were happy, nobody really cared. So I could <coughs> integrate women's history as much as I liked, which initially wasn't too easy because there wasn't so much to read, but it did get easier through the late 70s and into the 80s. Um, and well, so it carried on until I left Goldsmiths to go to Sussex as Professor of Contemporary History in 1993. And after I accepted the appointment, the first thing the Vice Chancellor said to me was, you know you've increased the number of women professors at Sussex by 50%. It had gone up from two to three in <laughs> radical Sussex. This was a new Vice Chancellor who was rather shocked by what he found, and he did go on to appoint a number of women, I'm glad to say. I also counted how many women had history chairs in 1993 in the country, and there were eight. I can't remember who now, but I could only locate. It changed quite rapidly later in the 90s, but that was the situation in the early 90s. But now I'm gonna hand over to Selena because that's where I met her, uh, in our first cohort of MA students. Thanks, Pat. Um, so my introduction to uh, women's history came at a very early age because um, uh, I'm the daughter of, of Ruskin graduates um, and they were at Ruskin in the late 1960s um, and made that upward mobility journey that a very, very tiny proportion of people were able to do through going to Ruskin. Um, they then left and my dad wanted to do a degree um, at Lancaster University and um, he couldn't um, because uh, he'd failed his 11 plus and his local education authority refused him a grant um, because even though he'd been to Ruskin, um, they felt that because he wasn't in the 15% of past 11 plus, he didn't deserve this grant. And so they, they got um, married, my mom and dad, so that they could then fraudulently claim for a grant from the Inner London Education Authority, um, which was then offering grants to married mature students who lived in the area. They didn't live in London. They had to fraudulently uh, use a friend's address. Um, simply for him to get a degree. And this was in the age of the welfare state. So with that kind of history, you know, how could I be anything but um, uh, affected by issues to do with class and to do with gender? And I grew up in um, uh, a middle-class household in Newcastle-upon-Tyne where you know, we had all of these books, all of these Rago classics um, that we heard about yesterday. But for me, feminism was always intertwined um, uh, with, with more general issues to do with oppression and particularly with class. Um, something that I wanted to mention, because it, it's interesting, it came out of April Galway's talk this morning, and it's often forgotten, is that one of the narratives um, for very good reasons that Sally Alexander pointed us to yesterday of the first generation, if we're thinking about this generational moment that this conference has identified, is of girls who did pass the 11 plus and went to selective grammar schools. They were a small minority, but people <coughs> like Pat were, were among them. And it's an important part of, of, of our shared history. But there was an equally important but very un underdocumented educational moment in the recent British past, which was the introduction of comprehensive education and the abolition of the 11 plus. And it's very interesting that the one person at this conference who has explicitly mentioned their secondary education is April Galway, who went to a comprehensive school, and I'm gonna become number two, because my sort of formal introduction to women's history was at my provincial inner city, very large comprehensive, a co-educational comprehensive, where social history was very strong. And that was not unusual because these schools had to think, how are we gonna interest kids? Um, and so doing the history of your family and your street was one way of doing that. 
And when we were 13, we didn't do history, we did humanities um, lessons. So they were very interdisciplinary. I grew up with this idea that interdisciplinarity was a very good thing um, and was just natural. And um, one of the things that, that we were asked to do uh, was to go and undertake an oral history interview with the oldest woman that we knew. And the teacher's top oral history tip was, don't tell her kids that you're interviewing her because she's the <laughs> oldest woman you know. <laughs> And it was just great, you know, it was just, it was just fantastic. It, it blew my mind. And of course, what we were doing was a history of everyday life as well, but one that was very much inflected by the idea that gender mattered and that feminism mattered. Um, and, and we studied the history of feminism um, and the history of social change. So that was, that was great. Um, and then I became an undergraduate at the University of Warwick and I chose to go there because it was strong on labor and social history. Um, and there were certain issues that I had with the undergraduate curriculum there, but um, I want to be really clear that to me, those, those male labor and social historians, they're not the enemy. There were, there were problems, but in a way, they helped to create spaces where, where we as women historians have been able to operate. Um, and I owe Warwick a great debt because there were not many universities, even in 1993, that were willing to let me in. <laughs> and I had a choice, you can apply up to up to six universities in the UK. I got two offers. One was Sussex, one was Warwick. Um, so, you know, these places, they, they created spaces. Um, I was only taught by men in the three years that I was at Warwick. And the only women's history that I did was very interestingly um, taught by the Americanists who um, were completely up for the idea that you read about women every week, whatever topic you did, that you would research women, um, that this was absolutely mainstream. And that was not the case on the British labor and social history courses that I did. But that experience of women's history as once again something that one group of people at least saw as completely natural um, was something that, that really inspired me. The other thing that happened to me at Warwick was Joan Scott. Um, and um, it's really interesting hearing about people's experiences and how that differs according to place and age. And for me, um, I came to, to know about Joan Scott through our third year, our final year, uh, course on historiography, and I found it a very debilitating experience, um, partly because it felt like experience was being taken out of history, and nobody was really sure what was being put in, um, other than discourse, which seemed to me an intellectual game-playing exercise, um, and was wrapped up, certainly in the British press at that time, with a lot of talk about the end of history and the end of social movements. And coming from Newcastle, despite coming from a middle-class background, Coming from Newcastle, one couldn't help but be aware that the gap between the richest and the poorest in Britain was at this point in the 1990s growing more rapidly than it had been for 50 years. So the idea that we were at the end of history and that experience didn't matter made me very angry. Um, and there was also, I guess, very understandably, a complete disjuncture between the theory that we were being taught, Joan Scott, and the actual practice of history as our tutors and mentors were carrying it out because they hadn't really completely imbibed and, and uh, you know, brought into their teaching the theory that they were, that they were teaching us. And, and I say that not as a criticism of them, but just as something that I think is challenging for all of us, you know, that when we're dealing with new bodies of theory and we're thinking about how to communicate that to students, and they're trying to learn from our practices at the same time, you know, it can be hard really to integrate the two sometimes. Um, so I didn't, I, I, I felt very alienated by that and I, I left university feeling very stupid because I didn't really understand what James Scott was about and why people seemed to love it and, and you know, just thought, oh, I want to get out of here. But anyway, I was lured back um, into, into the academy um, after going out into the real world of work <laughs> and realizing that that was, that was much less fun than reading Joan Scott. Um, <laughs> even. <laughs> um, and so I applied for a series of, of master's degrees and it's instructive actually that um, I realized through something that uh, when, when, the, when Anna Clark's panel was on yesterday and talking about institutionalization, the limits of institutionalization as Anna did, and I suddenly thought about the places that I'd applied to and every single department or university that I applied to do graduate work at has now closed or merged or collapsed. <laughs> 
um, because and they were all quite new universities on the on the margins, with the exception of Sussex. Um, so it's very revealing that you know the universities in the UK that are currently being decimated are absolutely the ones that, to me, as somebody who wanted to become a graduate student, were the ones that looked exciting, that looked innovative, that looked like they were doing feminist history and women's history in really interesting ways. So um, I went to Sussex, um, and it was it was great. It was it was a real eye opener, and the first. Um, the first course that I did on this, this master's that Pat had been very instrumental in setting up in contemporary history um, was, was a core course on women's lives, life histories, and social change. Um, and what was very instructive for me about that course was that um, uh, it used biography in the way that Catherine Gleedle talked about using biography yesterday, both as a way of understanding individual women, but also as bringing together a nexus of themes um, through which we could look at women's role as agents of change and the limits to that in the past, which was just terrific. And also, it did synthesize theory and practice in really, in really interesting ways. And it was through doing that course that I came to realize that the whole culture war was not an either or. I mean, I came to realize after years what I know many of our undergraduates just now take for granted, which is you can take some insights from that. You know, you don't have to accept wholesale post-structuralism and post-modernism. Um, and Pat was very, was very influential there because, because she, she was someone who tried to communicate that, I think, to, to students. And we spoke a lot about the relationship between representation um, and experience. Um, one of the things that, that really struck me too about becoming a graduate student was, was to some extent the behavioral differences between men and women, both my peers and also the tutors. Um, Pat co-taught the course with Carol Diehouse um, in what seemed a very inspirational and collaborative model. Um, within the master's program, I think we as students felt a great deal of solidarity with each other. But it was very interesting that the men on the program were all very clear that they wanted to be academics um, and very clear about their career goals. Um, and we didn't, really, the women, the women on it. I think, you know, in, in a good way. I mean, you know, we've heard from people already who've said, you know, I entered graduate school, I just wanted to learn more. And I think that was my experience. Um, and, you know, and that's a, that's a great way to be. But nonetheless, it was instructive that, you know, the men were sort of very focused. And I think about that now, now that the job market is a lot tighter, and what that does to people, and actually the way in which, you know, that careerist mentality can really help some of these young men young men get to get to the top. Um, and I think during my, so during my time at Sussex, I decided that I was going to uh, write a thesis that was very uh, much inspired by the work that we did and the kinds of speakers that Pat and other tutors invited to the research seminars there, many of whom worked on everyday life um, and looking at ordinary people as agents of change. Um, and I decided that I was going to work on that area but another very big influence for me, which is perhaps unusual, is that I was very involved in Marxist and anarchist politics outside of the university. And it was through that network that I came to decide to work on work, um, because they were a group of people who, at a time when academically work was unfashionable, to them it wasn't. Um, and so I decided that I would do a thesis looking at young working class women and the, the significance of, of, of work in their lives. Um, and while I was doing that thesis, I never really felt like I was, like I was part of a, of a women's history network. Um, and I found this event very challenging in some ways because the, the narrative that I've always told about that is that I went to a few conferences and just felt like they weren't for me and you know, these people weren't, you know, weren't speaking to my interests. Um, and actually, I, I've come to realize in the last couple of days that to some extent that's true, but not really. That I made the mistake that I think a lot of graduate students did, which is that I confused intellectual rigor with masculine arrogance. <laughs> and so, <laughs> actually, um, I be made a beeline for things like the Economic History Society Conference because I thought that's where the hard work was, and I wanted to be part of those networks. Um, and it's, it's interesting, you know, I think, you know, there are, there are models of working that to graduate students look like that's the game you have to play, you know, to get on, you know, and, and to make it, and to be seen as bright, you know, which is a word that we bandy around in this profession madly, and doesn't really mean anything, you know, it's some kind of weird value judgment. Um, 
so, so I didn't really feel like I was networked into women's history, but I, I kept on coming back to it, and I was lucky enough to have a first job back at Warwick, um, uh, where there was a great deal of sympathy for women's history and also for, for gender history. Um, and I feel like I'm fortunate now to be working in Oxford, but less so because of the history faculty, notwithstanding great colleagues like Catherine Gleedle, and more because, much to my surprise, I find myself in a majority female Oxford Women's College, which was not the place I ever expected to end up. But I mean, you know, get over it, because how many of us expected to end up in the jobs that we're in? Um, uh, which is an incredibly supportive interdisciplinary environment. And probably I spend more time in the college than I do dealing with the history faculty. Um, and that feels, that feels ideal. But it makes me wonder, I mean, how, you know, because you did then spend quite a long time at Sussex and then at London. So, I mean, how, how was it then being in a, in a history department? Well, of course, <coughs> even at Sussex, it wasn't a history department because Sussex was still interdisciplinary then. And I was in a school of social sciences and half of my teaching was to social scientists, often working with other tutors who were social scientists. And then I was also in and for a time chair of the history subject group, which was scattered over different schools. So it was very different from being in a conventional history department. Then I went to the Institute of Historical Research, which is not a department. And <coughs> I was only teaching graduates, and it was a, it's a strange kind of place anyway. And uh, now I'm only partially in a history department and half out of it in a cross-disciplinary institute. So I've always had close links with other disciplines and have never been tied into history mm. and have avoided doing so, but without trying very hard, I just haven't been. Mm. So. But I was struck that you started out by talking about the influence of your parents, which people haven't been talking about. And it did make me wonder about the generations and, and about transmission from parents to children. And I was having a conversation with my daughter last Sunday, not because of this conference, it arose from something else, where she started complaining about how her friends keep coming up with these feminist ideas that they think are completely new. And she says, I can remember you and your friends talking about that when I was a child, Mum. <laughs> but but, but then she deserves it that her friends aren't aware of this, so they don't have any knowledge of past feminism. And there must be a big difference if you just grow up and take these ideas for granted or at some other point have to learn them. Maybe it's something we could discuss later. Mm. Another issue is this one of <laughs> having networks not only with other academic disciplines, but outside academic life. And we heard a lot yesterday. I mean, first of all, what struck me about Susan's account of coming to Britain in 1980 is that you met did a whole lot of things with different people, almost all of them outside universities, all over the country. <laughs> And then when Sally was talking, it was about the role of further education, the WEA and other organizations outside universities as the place where women's history really developed. Then this morning, we heard very little about such contacts, as though women's history had somehow come into the universities. But there are, there's the Women's History Network, for example, which is a national network which runs regional conferences and workshops and draws in people who are not professional historians. And unfortunately, the whole, well, the whole further education system that did so much to sustain all kinds of important adult education uh, began to be killed off by Thatcher, like many things, and is almost completely gone. But do you have a sense of being in contact with networks outside the universities? Yeah, uh, I, I think that I think that there are some, um, and one of the one of the the interesting things that I've become involved with very recently is uh, there's a website in the UK called Mumsnet, 
um, which is a very uh, eclectic um, uh, bunch of people. But when I say bunch, thousands of, of mothers. Although, as one of my friends said, oh, you, know, we, you don't have to have children to go on mum's night. I mean, that's really passe, you know. Um, <laughs> But it began as a sort of support network for um, a group of middle-class women who were finding parenting challenging um, uh, and has, has grown. And so there are all kinds of things on Mumsnet now and all kinds of directions that you can take it in. But one of the, the things that, that Mumsnet does is it runs an academy, which is its name for um, successive weekend schools and day workshops for the kind of women who 10, 15 years ago we would have been seeing at Sussex as mature students coming in from access courses. I mean, they absolutely kept my early teaching in women's history going. Um, but who now, for financial reasons and because they're thinking about their kids' tuition fees, are not coming into the universities. And so are going on these weekend courses to, to um, go into discussion sessions on things like fat is a feminist issue, how to break the diet trap, through to an introduction to classics from the Oxford Classics faculty. You know, so it's, it's very, very diverse. And, and they approached me and said, can you put on a two-day course on women's history? Because although they do invite men, up to 80% of the people who attend their courses are women. Um, and I thought that was just great. And it testifies to something that Lucy DeLapp spoke about and that other people have spoken about, which is that thirst for history is definitely still there. And that thirst for women's history is still there. Not even gender history, women's history. And also, I think, the history of feminism. Um, I think there are definitely people who, um, who are interested in that. Um, so I think that's there. I think the other thing which is, which is hopeful is that um, one of the... Uh, things that we're encouraged to do in the UK when we're applying for research grants now is to think about public impact and public significance. And, and really, on the whole, I think it's a very reactionary agenda, and it's about, again, putting the humanities on the defensive, because it's about engaging with business, really. But you can sometimes use it, and in the era of public yeah. spending cuts, you can use it in interesting ways. And I was really inspired a couple of weeks ago. I went to a conference down in Bristol with a group of... Um, historians who are tenured at UK institutions in European history and we all wanted to work on, on women's lives in post-war Europe. But one of the things that was really interesting was that we were then able to bring into the conference um, uh, archivists and librarians and some local uh, city tour guides, all of whom are desperate to try and find ways to keep their jobs. Um, and talk about, well, how can we put together some kind of collaborative grant application where we actually think creatively about how we as a group of feminist historians and researchers and workers can work together to come up with something that might be really exciting. And I mean, it'll make some of you who spoke yesterday laugh because actually I went, as a, as a historian primarily of work, I went expecting that we'd probably end up with something on identity or maybe leisure. And actually the title that we, that we came up with, that we all agreed to, was women work and value <laughs> and it was and everybody in the room was saying yeah this is this is what I want to work on or this is what this is what you know would work for my archive or my library or the adult ed class that I teach that we're losing funding for um, and so I think that there are spaces there mm. but I wonder if you've seen that in your work with you know with policymakers and the other things that you're involved with I mean those sorts of things you've described <coughs> are going on in um a number of localities. I know there's one in Kent, and I read about one in Greenwich recently, so there's quite a lot of that. And our <coughs> history and policy unit, which Lucy will be directing from April, is about connecting, or informing policy makers, including civil servants and the media, about what historians are doing in accessible ways, <coughs> conveyed to them accessibly relevant re research by historians. And they do seem to be responding. What impact is having a policy? I have no idea. But for example, we've run a series of seminars with the Department for Education, to which Selena made an excellent contribution on the history of things like childcare, um, adoption, a whole a set of issues concerning the early years and also young people sort of following on from the riots. <coughs> Have young people ever rioted before? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what were the causes? 
the kind of thing that's happening now. They're unemployed. They're being neglected. Their services are being cut. <coughs> and what was done to help them restore the services and <laughs> get them jobs and education. And the civil servants are extremely responsive. About 80 will turn up and they ask interesting questions. But I doubt our present ministers are listening. Um, but at least we're trying to communicate history to the rest of the world and there are people willing to listen. Mm. Can I ask you something about the, the rest of the world? Because obviously yeah. we've talked a bit about Europe, we've talked a bit about some of the really exciting developments in transnational history and imperial history. But one of the things that, that's characterized your work um, and one of the things that, that I am in increasingly enjoying is collaboration. And I know that you know, most of the history that you've written has been history of uh, England or of Britain, but I wondered if you could say something about how collaboration internationally has informed your work as a women's historian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's become increasingly international, but a lot of it has been with Europe, and Europe is very important. And I think it does make me think in new ways about what's happening in Britain. <coughs> to compare similar things happening in other countries. And I've just found it enormously fruitful talking to regular friends in France, in Germany. And the book I co-edited with Gisela Bock, which was women from all over Europe talking about maternity and welfare policies, uh, <coughs> was an outcome of those sorts of exchanges. There's been a lot with people in Scandinavia, particularly because of the welfare issues that I work on. Um, and it, in some ways, it's become easier over the time period, partly because we joined the European Union, and I profoundly hope we stay in it, <laughs> which, among other things, is a source of funding. And they've been funding networks of conferences and researchers precisely to bring together people from the ever-growing European Union, or certainly the European Union, that's much bigger than it was. And that's been very fruitful. The other really important development since I began all of this is the European Social Science History Conference. Mm. And I can't remember when that started, in the late 70s, 80s maybe, but it goes every two years. And it's, a, it's the one place where lots of Europeans get together with Americans and Australians and others. And the they have a strand which is always devoted to, I don't know whether they call it gender history or women's history. Uh, there's also a demography strand and a um, various welfare strands. And I've always got competing <laughs> allegiances. But that's been another excellent way of getting people together from across Europe and then drawing in other countries. So I think. It's become easier to make these contacts, mm. but mm. Um, they're certainly there, and they're they're important. Yeah, I think yeah. I think I'd agree with that, and um, it it does feel a lot easier now to collaborate within Europe. And I think that there is a space, isn't there, for for women's history where one writes the history of one country, but with that awareness um, that your work and um, the work of Jose Harris as well has been really influential in, 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 in highlighting new dimensions by illuminating these comparisons um, in terms of the situation in Germany and France and other European countries. Um, and I think at a, at a more prosaic level, as somebody who's spent more of her career in history departments, male-dominated history departments. Something that I found about collaboration, you know, I was interested in this debate this morning about can men write women's history. Um, I, I guess I feel like there's, there's, space for, there's space for both. You know, there's space for collaboration and for men to be part of this project. But actually, I do like working in women-only spaces, and I like working with women as collaborators. And maybe that is partly about having been in male-dominated history departments, but I do go out of my way now to look for opportunities to collaborate with other, with other women, with, with other feminist historians. I like those kinds of spaces, and I think that we can gain something from keeping them. We don't have to say it's either or. You know, we, we, can, we can have both to some extent. I think the collaboration and comparisons we need more of are actually across the countries of the United Kingdom. Um, 
April mentioned this morning to have, uh, her thesis was on England, and so is our book, and I'm married. Because Scotland and Ireland are very different places yeah. when it comes to family law culture. And, I mean, Esther Breitenbach and I ran a series of seminars funded by the SRC on the different politics of the four countries, which came about when s such large numbers of women were elected to the devolved parliaments in Wales and Scotland, compared with a much smaller number in England. And we wanted to know why, mm -hmm. and we published the essays. <coughs> and that was very interesting. But I would like to do much more of that sort yeah, of that comparison. Should, Should we, we open invite? it up? Yeah. yeah, we've got sort of five, six, seven minutes <laughs> if people want to make contributions <laughs> or ask questions. Indeed for that. It's really fascinating to hear both of your intellectual biographies. Um, just, I've just got sort of two questions, really. And one of them is about women's studies. I mean, you've both emphasized the importance of, of feminist theory to you and collaboration with women, but neither of you mentioned women's studies. And I was just curious to know if it was the case that it just wasn't part of either of your trajectories, kind of why you think that was. So there's the women's studies question. I mean, it comes from, as I said yesterday, it was a terribly important part of my own intellectual formation. And the other really is about, I mean, you're both historians of class, and class is obviously terribly important as a category of analysis for both of you because of your interests in poverty and in work and so on. Um, and I'm just interested to know whether there are a sort of ever kind of tensions of re kind of reading gender through class that, or, diff or just interesting issues about it and where ethnicity fits in. Oh, I mean, I haven't been directly part of any women's studies institute or, and there was one at Sussex where I did make some contributions to, but I don't know, I just never, <laughs> I've had other things to do. <laughs> I'm not hostile to the idea. It, it just didn't happen. And on, I've never found any conflict between gender and classes. I mean, I don't find it hard to cope with the fact that people have multiple identities. And certainly working on women in the Labour Party who were very conscious of being women and being working class uh, made me very aware that you know, they could cope with those two identities and, bel and believe they were serving both causes. And similarly, with somebody who happens to be black, working class and female, that's, that's another set of problems and issues and realities they have to deal with. But I think everybody lives with multiple identities and of region, of religion, of all the things that help to form our lives. And it's made life more complicated, but I think history is much more interesting when you don't have just simple divisions. I think for me, I, I certainly, some of the programs that I mentioned as having been closed down that I'd applied to as a graduate student were in women's studies. And what attracted me to Sussex was that you could um, study the masters in contemporary history, but you could take courses in women's studies, you could take papers in women's studies. Um, and, and that attracted me because I did feel that, that primarily um, I was a historian um, and that there was something about that methodology of being a historian that was quite, that, that was quite important to me um, and that was a way that felt appropriate to make sense of the world I was in. Um, and so I didn't feel that I necessarily wanted to go into women's studies. And then at a certain level, I think it became an issue for a lot of people um, because, and this relates to something that you talked about with the, the difficulties of institutionalization yesterday, Penny, that of course, in an era where it became more and more difficult to get graduate funding, so many of those women's studies programs were absolutely squeezed because it was easier to get funding for you know, respectable disciplines like history. Um, and I, I can't remember now whether that was part of my thinking, but it, it could well have been. It could well have been. Um, and in terms of the, um, the issue of, of gender and class and ethnicity, um, I always say to my students, to me, that's the biggest tension um, in my work. And I think it's a productive tension. I think it's a question that we have to continually ask is how, how do we go from um, 
understanding these as, as multiple identities to thinking about how they then um, affect social and political change. And, and, and that's a, a big question for a lot of us, right? Like, what's the relationship between identity and experience? And, and how do we join those two? And I think it's something that many of us grapple with productively. Um, but I do, so I certainly don't, don't think that I'd give primacy to class or, or primacy to gender, but I would say that I felt like my work was informed by my anger that after Joan Scott, but also coming out of um, a particular brand of feminism, as I, as I read it through some of those memoirs of the 1970s, that British feminism had become largely about uh, middle-class women or about discourse. Um, and, and, and I do worry about that. You know, I think that, that, that we still are fighting, really, um, to, to put working class women's experience in there and not simply to talk about them as in terms of representation. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely, I think, a, a tension there in terms of how we theorize that. But I think, you know, that's great. That's, that's part of the discussion that we have to have as historians. I wanted to um, bring up again a question that was raised yesterday about, uh, uh, oh, here we are, um, about um, feminism or feminist methodologies um, and models of work that I think came up um, more explicitly in this panel just now again. But I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit more, um, how you sort of um, re recognize uh, using models that you would consider feminist um, or to, to what degree you think of them that way. It's collaboration to feminist uh, methodology and how you um, teach that or use that in your um, cl uh, classroom or teaching or mentoring? Do you have an answer? I'm, I'm not conscious of employing a particularly feminist methodology. <laughs> I think, um, no, I think, I think the way that I've used it has probably been more to try to, um, to, to, to use a, f a feminist methodology of of looking at everyday life, and I mean this, I say feminist methodology with with no capitalization because this is just what I took from feminist historians who taught me um, to see everyday life as a, a a sphere where one might talk about collective action as well as personal identity, um, because I think that with labor history and social history we saw work as the place where social and political change happened. And I think one of the great things that feminist historians did was to say, um, not simply that home and domestic and schools and, and educational spaces are places where identity is created, but they're also spaces where social change might occur. Um, and for me, that's been, that's been something that I've tried to emphasize in my teaching, um, as well as in my research. We need to finish now because yeah. we're going uh -huh. to Skype. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay.